Thank you so much for joining us in person and for joining us online. My name is Britt. Would you please stand with us if you're able as we begin worship this morning? Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces. Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom There is freedom Come out of the dark Just as you are Into the fullness of His love Oh, the Spirit is here Let there be
when before the throne. Good morning, church. I'm going to invite you to have a seat this morning. Uh, I would like to say a few things uh, acknowledging the realities in which we live. Uh, We live in a couple of realities at the same time. Uh, The first reality we live in um, is that things are not the way they're supposed to be, that the world is broken. Stuff is messed up. The kingdom of God has come very close, but it has not yet fully arrived. Uh, And that part of the reality in which we live was very clear these last couple of weeks. Uh, The second reality in which we live at the same time is the reality in which uh, Jesus has said the kingdom of God is very close. It's very close at hand. It's breaking in everywhere. It's not quite here, but it's so close. You can taste it. You can feel it. You can see it. You can experience it sometimes. Every time peace is made, the kingdom of God breaks in. Every time a relationship is reconciled, the kingdom of God is breaking in. Every time someone says yes to Jesus, the kingdom of God is breaking in. Every time life is preserved, the kingdom of God is breaking in in that moment. And so we live in two realities at the same time. A reality in which the kingdom of God is very close at hand, that Jesus has come and inaugurated this magnificent new kingdom, and it is not yet fully here. Things are not yet the way they ought to be. It is unspeakably evil what happened in Texas this week. 19 children, two teachers, and one shooter dead. It is unspeakably evil what happened the week before that at Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church in Laguna Woods. One person dead, five critically injured. It is unspeakably evil what happened in Buffalo the day before that. Ten mostly elderly people dead. We live in a world 
in the midst of a reality in which things are not yet the way they are supposed to be. It is not supposed to be like this. Jesus, when he got word that one of his very closest friends named Lazarus had died, and he died kind of young, like kind of prematurely, when he got word that Lazarus had died, and then when he saw the community in which Lazarus lived, he saw their grief. He saw their weeping and their mourning and their wailing. When Jesus saw that picture of death, you know what Jesus did? He wept. He started to cry. He grieved with the community who had lost Lazarus. He mourned, he lamented, because this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not how it's supposed to turn out. And so Jesus wept. In John chapter 11, we're told that Jesus was deeply disturbed in his inner being. He was gut-wrenched to the core because of the pain and death that he saw around. And I want this to be for you an invitation to join Jesus in his weeping. Because I think this is what Jesus would do. You know, what is a faithful response? What are we supposed to do? I don't know, but I do know that one time when something like this happened, Jesus cried. He stood with a community who had lost someone and he wept. And so let that be an invitation to you to weep with him, to grieve the unspeakably evil things that have happened. Jesus said that the evil one has come to steal away and destroy life. And we saw that in recent weeks. And, you know, this is what we're hearing about is only what we're hearing about. There's a lot more, too. There's a lot more going on that we, that we don't hear about. And Jesus says the evil one comes to kill and to destroy, but I have come that you, that they may have life and have it to the fullest. We worship a Lord of life. We worship a Lord of hope. We worship the Lord of the kingdom, whose kingdom is breaking in, but it's not yet here. But it's really close. And so... I want to acknowledge that grief today, and I want you to acknowledge that grief today, and I want you to hear that invitation to join Jesus in simply grieving and weeping with those who are hurting. And so in light of that invitation, in light of that reality, um, I'm going to invite you to stand again if you are able, and I'm going to invite you into a minute of silence to join Jesus in grieving over what is not yet right. Come, Lord Jesus, we need you. We need you more than ever. Bring your kingdom, Jesus. Bring your kingdom of life and peace, your kingdom of grace and mercy. Bring your kingdom, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you surround and comfort those who are grieving today? We think especially of the families in Texas, in Buffalo, in Laguna Woods, and we know there are many more that we have not heard about. Holy Spirit, would you comfort them in your mercy, be palpably present in those moments of pain. Even as we gather here today, the day before Memorial Day, we also remember 
so many who have lost their lives serving our country. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you especially would surround those who continue to grieve and mourn the loss of loved ones, loved ones who have served our country. We need you, Jesus, for you are the Lord of life. We stand with you as you weep over what is not the way it's supposed to be. We stand with you as you weep, and we stand with you against any kind of violence. For you are the Lord of life, the one who has come to grant life to the fullest. We need you, Jesus. We need you more. Thank you that you are here, that you are present, and that ultimately, Death does not have the final word. Help us today to enter into that reality. Especially today, help those who are grieving the loss of so much. Help them to enter into this reality. That because of you, death does not have the final word. Thank you, Jesus. We need you. Come. Lord Jesus.
You may be seated. Hello. I've come from afar to give you the announcements today. My name is Britt. If you didn't know me already, it's nice to meet you. Um, we have a theme here as CPC of connection. Um, we want to find ways of connecting with God's heart, his people, and his mission. So um, the first way that we can get connected here is by scanning the QR code that is in front of you on the chair of seats, or the row of chairs in front of you. Um, there's like a little QR code, so just point your phone's camera there, and it'll bring up a link. And on that link, you'll find our website where you can um, put in prayer requests, you can find events that are happening, or you can um, give online as well. So I just want to urge you to check out that QR code. Next, um, we have a class coming up on the 1st and 8th of June with Dean called The Bible for Beginners. This is a great class if you are confused about where to maybe start, how to study the Bible, um, or if you're just unfamiliar in general, it's a great class to get um, introduced or just more... Um, more deeply oriented with the Bible. So this is a class great for everybody, um, aimed for beginners, but please um, check that out if you're interested. You can sign up online for that as well. Um, the next uh, announcement I wanna bring to your attention is our VBS happening June 27th to the July 1st. I got a chance to do this last year and it was super, super fun. So please, if you um, can find the time this summer to volunteer, we could really use the help. We have a lot of kids signed up and we need a lot of volunteers. Um, if you also would um, not mind keeping some cardboard boxes, we need a few boxes of all sizes, clean please, uh, to decorate for VBS. So if you could, um, if you have those boxes, bring them to the reception desk in the first, on the first floor next to where the preschoolers come in. That would be very, very helpful. And then one last note about VBS. We have two trainings um, after church on the 5th and then on the 19th as well. So please contact Jericho if you have any additional questions about that. But we have... Um, we just need you to go to one training session. So if you are volunteering for VBS, you will go to either the 5th or the 19th. You don't have to attend both. And then our last um, connection opportunity is this Thursday on the 2nd of June at 7 p.m. We're gonna be holding our Illuminate um, Night of Worship here in the worship hall. So if you would um, please join us for that. It's, there's something very special about worshiping at night altogether. So um, please check that out and invite uh, whoever you'd like to invite to that. We would love to see you there. Um, at this time, would you please rise and greet a neighbor for just a few minutes?
Good morning, I'm Jim Thompson. I'll be reading the scripture today, reading from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. If you want to turn there in your Bibles or on your devices or just follow along on the screen. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Jim, you're the perfect person to have read that text. (laughs) So fun. Uh, A number of years ago, a good friend of mine, mentor Tim, uh, he and I went to the beach in Vancouver, uh, B.C., Uh, this beach, in fact. um, It's called Spanish Banks. And uh, we went here for a swim in the summertime, and uh, the water in the summer is still freezing because it's Canada. Um, and uh, so it was, it was cold, but we went for a swim, and we were kind of looking for a workout. We pictured, or we found on this buoy, it was like down, down the shoreline, like 200 yards, although we were in Canada, it was 200 meters off the shore. And uh, we're like, hey, that'd be a good place to uh, swim to. So we hopped in, uh, this beautiful blue ocean water. It's just gorgeous. Hopped in, swam down to the buoy, took a break, and then um, uh, swam back to the shore. And by that point, our muscles were pretty like frozen. And so we kind of thawed out on the shore. And then my buddy Tim, he was like, you know what? I'm not really up for uh, swimming back. I think I'm just going to walk back uh, down the beach back to where our bags were. I was like, that's cool. I think I'm going to swim. I like to swim. I think I'm going to swim uh, back. And so uh, he started walking back to where we had started, and I started walking back into the water out towards the buoy so I could swim uh, back to where we had started. And I, I got in, and I got about waist deep, and I was about to dive in. And what happened next will stay with me for a really long time. Yeah, and I'll tell you about it in 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for these words that you gave to your prophet Isaiah, and uh, we thank you that you spoke to him and through him to the people in Judah in uh, the 8th century B.C., and we thank you that you continue to speak to us your words through the prophet Isaiah in this 21st century um, after the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We pray, God, that your words here would um, not only like inform us, but that these words would actually transform the way in which we live. We don't want to just become smarter about you. We want to become more like you. And we believe that your words have a tendency to do this to people. So would you do this to us today as we consider your word through Isaiah chapter 6? We pray this in the faithful name of Jesus, the living word. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You know, I can say a date, uh, just a date. I can just mention a date and fill your minds with all sorts of things, all sorts of pictures, memories, etc. September 11th. That's all I need to say. And a whole story, a whole narrative uh, has just rushed into your minds. Um. Here's a new one now. March 2020. 
I can say that. And, uh, and a whole host of memories and experiences and associations rush um, into your mind. This is the equivalent of what the prophet Isaiah did when he began chapter 6 with these words, in the year that King Uzziah died. What would have come to mind to Isaiah's contemporaries when he said, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died? Now, for you and me, that's kind of meaningless because, you know, we have no idea what happened the year that King Uzziah died unless we do a whole bunch of reading and research. Well, let me give you a, just a little bit of a history uh, lesson. So Uzziah was uh, a great king in Judah. He was a faithful king. He reigned for a long time. Um, and uh, under his leadership, he uh, was able to uh, restore the strength of the Judean army. He um, regained control of a strategic port on the Red Sea. He also controlled, uh, gained control of, um, of a plateau of a strategic peri, uh, prairie west of Judah. Um, these two holdings meant that um, there were all sorts of tariff and tax income that was new and that was flooding into Judah at that time. And Uzziah, being a good king, he used all of those royal revenues to invest in infrastructure. And, and it was like a really good time for the nation of Judah. He brought jobs. The economy was growing. National stability increased. Um, and as I have said, he invested in the infrastructure rather than just padding his own pockets with all of these tariff and tax proceeds. So the days of King Uzziah, they were really good days. And we're told in the Old Testament book of Chronicles um, that the reason Uzziah was such a good king was because he was faithful to the Lord. He sought to be faithful to the Lord, to do things the way God wanted him to do them, to lead and to reign the way that the Lord commanded. Unfortunately, as um, is often the case, um, Uzziah's success kind of went to his head, and he began to think like, man, I'm, I'm amazing. And uh, he stopped giving God the credit, and he started taking the credit for himself, and so he stopped walking in the ways of the Lord. He became less faithful to the living God. Of course, this rubbed off on all the rest of the people. Uh, and in the years leading up to Uzziah's death, um, the, the nation, the country, um, had an increasing sense of uneasiness because uh, the encroachment of a couple of very powerful nations at their borders. By the time that King Uzziah died, it was some time around 740, 739 BC, you know, 740 years before the birth of Christ. By that time, um, Assyria's aggressive army, so Assyria was like the main player, uh, the, the main world superpower. Assyria's aggressive army now flanked Judah on both the east and the west sides. I mean, in fact, on the north border of Judah, there was only one small, insignificant kingdom between Judah and Assyria, and that was the kingdom of Israel. That's a different story. But basically, Assyria had Judah surrounded and didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that it was only a matter of time before Judah would fall to the Assyrian army. Meanwhile, on the southern border of Judah, the Egyptians, as they kind of have always been doing, uh, they have been fighting with Judah over access and control of some major trade routes. If you have control of those trade routes, then you have control of lots of income uh, and exchange. And so basically the story is this. Uh, Judah is surrounded by enemies. And they're surrounded by enemies that are much larger than them, much stronger than them, much wealthier than them. So to say the least, times were precarious, right? And to add to all of that, Uzziah, the guy who was responsible for, you know, kind of bringing good times and, and whom the nation had looked to for so long, King Uzziah, he up and died. It's like things couldn't possibly get worse for the nation, at this point, the man who symbolized hope up and died. So it's into this context, into this uncertainty, you know, being surrounded by enemies. You know, the one that they had hoped in was dead. It's into this 
context that Isaiah chapter 6 invites us in the opening line. In the year that King Uzziah died, when things were uncertain, when things were precarious, when things were difficult, when things were scary, can, can you relate to this? Is it like, is this written for today or 740 B.C.? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Don't miss that. In a year when it seemed like the world was going to hell in a handbasket, in a world when every, in a, in a time when the world seemed as it was falling apart, when things were out of control, when everything was uncertain, in that world, I saw the Lord on the throne of the universe, in control in power and authority, ruling and reigning. In the midst of all of that certainty, the Lord was certainly on the throne of the universe. Does this speak to us? And I wonder what feels uncertain to you these days. Sometimes it feels like everything, doesn't it? Maybe your family feels uncertain. You know, maybe you're entering into a new season. Maybe uh, your children are moving away. Or maybe your marriage is on the rocks. Or maybe you're trying to adopt and it's not working out very well. Maybe your family feels uncertain. Or maybe your financial situation feels uncertain. Maybe um, the declining stock market and the increasing interest rates have got you feeling uncertain about whatever, retirement, about upcoming decisions, about hopes that you had that are now becoming dimmer because of those financial realities. Maybe medical bills are beginning to stack up. What uncertainties are you experiencing? Or what about this one? You know, maybe you just have a vacation planned and it's kind of uncertain because of COVID whether or not you can go, you know? Will you get COVID? Will somebody else get COVID? Will things be shut down? What are you uncertain about? And in the year 740 BC, when everything for Judah seemed so uncertain, in that year, Isaiah sees this vision, and in this vision, he sees the Lord on the throne, holy on the throne. The, robe of his, the train of his robe filled the temple. In other words, it was magnificent. His glory was more than Isaiah could take in. His power was overwhelming. He was in charge. There's a fancy theological word for this. It's called sovereignty. God is sovereign. He's in control, even when so much feels so uncertain. And this is really good news. This is the reality into which Isaiah is being invited to live his life. The Lord is showing Isaiah this because the Lord is saying, look, I, I don't want you to live into the reality of all the uncertainness. Like that's true, but that's not the primary reality that ought to define your life. The primary reality that ought to define your life is the reality that God is on the throne, no matter what's going on. I have already said this morning, we live in the midst of two different realities at the same time. One of the realities is that the world is broken. And the other reality is that the kingdom is coming. It's breaking in. God ultimately in Jesus Christ is victorious. And this is the reality that we're invited to make, uh, to define our lives by. What will be the primary plot line of your story? Will it be the uncertainty that you face or will it be the reality that God is on the throne? That he's good, that he's faithful. He knows what's going on. What happens next in the text is super weird. Isaiah cries out, he says, woe is me, I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah is like absolutely undone in the Lord's presence. Right? He sees God's holiness. He sees God's perfection. He sees God's beauty. And in that moment, Isaiah realizes, I am not holy like that. I am not perfect like that. I am not beautiful like that. And Isaiah has this unyielding sense that he is unworthy to be in the presence of this holy God. And uh, you know what comes to mind for me is, uh, is this guy. 
Uh, what I think of in this moment is like a 120-pound golden retriever that has just been uh, wrestling with dead fish in a mud puddle after a rainy day. Um, and this dog that is an absolute mess has somehow found his way into a $7 million home on the Newport coast that has all white carpet. <laughs> right? You, you just know that he is not supposed to be there. <laughs> You do not belong here. This is not where you should be. There was nothing that made Isaiah worthy of Yahweh's presence. It was like he should not be there, and Isaiah knew it. And you know what? Isaiah was right. He was not worthy to be in the presence of this holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And yet... Don't miss this. And yet the Lord chooses Isaiah. The Lord approaches Isaiah, pursues Isaiah. The Lord shows Isaiah a vision of himself. And the Lord forgives and cleanses Isaiah. Though he was unworthy, nevertheless, God pursued him and forgave him. Um, I don't know um, who, uh, who these people are, uh, but let me tell you about when Krista and I were dating and um, when we started to get uh, pretty serious, um, like really serious, um, we were like, hey, this, uh, this is going somewhere. And so um, I felt that I needed to have a really frank discussion with Krista. I needed to come clean with her about some realities in my life because this, like we're not playing games anymore. This is getting real. And so I had a really frank discussion with Krista about some really poor choices in previous dating relationships that I had made before I was a follower of Jesus, Um, that I had not saved myself for marriage, that I was not a virgin, that I could not give that gift to Krista, though she could give that gift to me. And in that moment, I had this sense of being utterly unworthy. And you know what? I was right. And yet, I mean, obviously, you know how the story goes. She said, yes. And you know what that is? Like, that is sheer grace. That's just unmerited, unearned, not because of anything you did. In fact, in spite of what you did, I choose to love you. And this is a beautiful picture of how God sees us, how God treats us, of what God thinks about us, what God thinks about Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah, you're right. You're not worthy to be in my presence, and yet I choose you to be here in my presence. Remember, Isaiah, I was the one that came to you, not you to me. You know, if that muddy golden retriever gets in that home, it's going to get kicked out right away. But that's not the experience that Isaiah had. He was not kicked out of Yahweh's house. In fact, he was welcomed in. One of the angels approaches Isaiah and uh, touches a burning coal to his lips. Oh, sorry, dog. There we go. Uh, one of the angels approaches Isaiah, touches, uh, touches his lips with some burning coals. I told you it was a weird scene. Um, and the angel says these words to him. He says, now that this has touched your lips, um, Oh, I'm lost here. I am so sorry. There we go. Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Isaiah, your guilt is no longer present. It's not that I've covered up your guilt or made your guilt invisible. Your guilt is not there anymore. Isaiah's guilt is now oxymoron. Those two things don't go together. It has been entirely removed. And in order that Isaiah doesn't miss this point, the Lord in his graciousness just says the same thing twice. It's on the screen. This is the same thing said two different ways. Isaiah, your guilt has departed. And if you're not sure about what that means, your sin is blotted out. Your culpability has exited the building. Right? Your blameworthiness just ran out the door. You're forgiven and you're forgiven. Jesus says while he's hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine 
To the very people who crucified him, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Blot out their guilt. Take away their sin. Do you believe that in Christ Jesus, through faith in him, your guilt has been taken away, your sin has been blotted out? Oh, to live into that reality. If you and I were to live into that reality today, how that would change our perspective, how that would change our relationships. That I am not guilty. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. Well, after Isaiah sees, you know, this overwhelming presence of the holy and all-powerful God, after he experiences a forgiveness, you know, this incredibly personal, transformative, like, wow, I'm not worthy to be here, and yet you, the holy God, approach me and wipe me clean of all that is unclean. After these experiences, Isaiah hears a voice calling out, and God says to him, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? What are you going to do in this moment? Put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. What are you going to do? Are you going to walk away? Think about what other agenda you could somehow get behind after having this experience. Think about some other Lord or God that you would give your life to after having this experience. What was Isaiah to do? How could he possibly walk away from this God? How could he possibly turn his back to this God after what he had experienced? And so I think Isaiah's response to the living God is the only sensible response he could have made. It just, it's given the evidence, given what he experienced, what else was he supposed to say? So he says, here I am. Here I am, God. Send me. Now, if I was Isaiah, I think I'd start asking some questions. Where are we going, God? What are we doing, God? When do we get there? How fun is it going to be? How difficult is it going to be? Am I going to have to give up anything? What's going to be in it for me? Give me a whole bunch more data so I can do a cost-benefit analysis to figure out whether or not this would be better for me or not in order for me to say yes to you. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like, we're sort of, you know, joking, but actually, isn't that kind of what we do? And yet, for Isaiah, and I think this is the invitation for us, once you have the who down, the when, the what, the how, the why, all of that doesn't really matter. It's secondary. Because the most important thing is, who are you going to follow? Who are you going to be with? Who are you going to obey? Who is going to be your God? All the rest, the consequences, are inconsequential. All that mattered to Isaiah in this moment was he wanted to obey and be with that guy. Sorry, it's not a guy. With that God. With that one. He wanted to be with God because of what he had experienced and you know, amazingly, the same thing happened with the first disciples of Jesus in the first century. I don't know if you are um, watching The Chosen, a great uh, series. I've watched, I don't know, like half of it or something. Um, they do a really good job of, of trying to capture um, how Jesus, in such few words, gets these people to follow him. And you know, these, uh, these young disciples are like, it's just there's something about his presence. There's something about the way he looks at me. There's something about the way he speaks. We just had to follow him. We just, we had to say yes. We wanted to say yes. I think that's Isaiah's experience right here. Uh, let's go back to the Spanish banks in Vancouver, shall we? Okay, so... So I walk in the water, I'm like waist deep, and uh, my friend Tim is walking down the shore, I'm all by myself, and uh, what had been these beautiful crystal clear blue waters 
suddenly to me became like this massive dark abyss under which all sorts of dangerous creatures were lurking. Right? It's the same water. It's just that now I'm alone. Now I'm on my own, by myself. I'm about waist deep, and one of these little guys pops his head up. You think it's cute. I did not think it was cute. It's like, I don't know, 100 feet away or something. It's a cute little harbor seal. Well, I did not see a cute little harbor seal when I was entering the dark, mysterious, uncertain waters of Spanish banks. I saw a 1,200-pound leopard seal <laughs> who was ready to eat me in a moment's notice. Right? And isn't this like... Isn't this what fear does, right? Fear magnifies the unknown. You know, never mind the fact that literally the nearest leopard seal to where I was was 9,000 miles away in Antarctica. But when I saw that cute little seal, this guy, my brain, which was influenced by fear, saw this guy. Because fear has a tendency to magnify the unknown. Why do you think fear not is the most common command in the Bible? Do not be afraid. You see, fear will lead you to unreasonable conclusions. It will lead you to do unreasonable things. It will make you think this cute little seal is actually a 1,200-pound leopard seal who is definitely going to eat you. Fear magnifies the unknown. But you know what's going on with Isaiah in this text? Is that faith magnifies the Lord. Right? Fear makes the unknown or our enemies seem bigger and more powerful than they actually are. But faith magnifies the living God. Right? Fear says, let me tell you how big your problems are. Faith, did I say faith? Fear makes you say, uh, makes me say, let me tell you how big your problems are. Faith says, let me tell you how good your God is. Fear says, oh, in the year that King Uzziah died, when everything was uncertain and it seemed like the nation was bound for destruction and the world is going to hell in a handbasket, faith says there is a God who sits on the throne of the universe and he's good and he's gracious and he's forgiving and he wants to be with you and the reality is you're not worthy to be in his presence but he's over it. He wants to be with you and he will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness so that you can enjoy one another's company. Fear magnifies the unknown. Faith magnifies the Lord. So what are we supposed to do with this? Right, what are we supposed to do with this information? I, I started this morning by praying that, oh God, you would not just inform us so that we would become smarter about you, but that you would transform us so that we would become more like you. So what are we supposed to do with this information? Well, here's the invitation that I want to extend to you. I think it's the invitation of the text. I think it's the invitation that God would have for us here in this 21st century in Huntington Beach at Christ Pacific. And the invitation is simply this. Will you take a step of faith today by identifying just an area of your life? You know, I, I think a small step approach is helpful, right? Just, just identify an area of your life about which you will begin to say to the Lord, in this area of my life, here I am. I will follow you come what may. That's the invitation for us today. Jesus, in this area of my life where it feels uncertain, maybe it's my family, maybe it's my finances, maybe it's my inability to take a day off, maybe whatever it is, what area of your life can you say to God, okay, okay, God, here I am. I'll follow you, come what may. I'll trust you because you're trustworthy. You are worthy of my trust. That's the invitation today. And I want to invite Pastor Jericho uh, to come up and to lead us in a time of prayer where we can think and pray about uh, that invitation. Thanks, Jericho.
Thank you, Peter. Um, what a great message for us this morning. Um, at this moment, um, we are going to have our garden of prayer. And so what we do on a Sunday morning is, yes, we sing these songs to Jesus and we hear these words. And so at this time, I would like to invite our prayer ministry team and our elders. Um, we're going to have a couple up front and then um, a few in the back. And so this time is um, for you. This time is for you. Um, is the Lord identifying those areas in your life where he's saying, follow me here. Follow me here. Um, it's not mandatory, but if you would like to receive prayer, we'd love to pray for you. And if that's too much, please email us at prayer at cpchb.org. It is a privilege for us to pray for you and with you. Um, and in light of all the tragedies that's happening, um, you know, in Texas, in New York, in Laguna Woods, and then the tragedies that don't get any media attention, right? And if you're like, I'm good, um, I can pray for the world, we invite you to do that as well. Uh, I love what Peter said, that if we can live in that reality that we're forgiven, and also if you forgot, you're forgiven. Um, and so I want to invite you to right now, if there are things that the Lord just highlighted in your heart, and you're just like, God, I just need to know that I'm forgiven and loved. All right, so please don't waste this time. Um, and would you join us in prayer now?
And she can stand with us if you'd like.
church, we're about to worship with this. Um, this is a new song. This is called Rest on Us. And I just want us to, um, this is about the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's worship. I know we don't know this one well, but it's repetitive. So do your best and let's worship with our last song. In the very beginning, the spirit of the living God hov hovered over the darkness and the chaos of the waters. That's how the scriptures begin. And in those moments, the spirit of the living God brought order out of chaos. He brought life where there was no life before. 
He brought creation and beauty. He brought you and me into the world. And so that song, may that be our prayer. Holy Spirit, come on us again. Open up the doors of heaven again. Fire and wind, do your thing. I'm paraphrasing. Sorry, I don't remember the lyrics exactly. <laughs> it's a new song. Come and do your thing again. Make us whole. Make us alive, for you are the Lord of life, and your kingdom, O oh God, is coming. Friends, go with this blessing. May you have power together with all of the saints across the globe who today have been worshiping this same living God on the throne and who throughout history have been worshiping this same living God on the throne whose name is Jesus Christ. May you have power together with all of those folks to grasp the magnitude of God's love, that love expressed most perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. And having grasped that love, May you be filled with all the fullness of God. Live in that reality today. God bless you. Thanks for joining us for worship today. Has the Lord convicted your heart today? Has he brought something up that you would like to pray about or talk to somebody about? Perhaps he has encouraged you to make a decision and you want to share that with somebody or you want support in the form of prayer, I want to invite you to email us. We would love to walk with you. We would love to pray for you. So will you email us at prayer at cpchb.org and give us the privilege of praying for you, of walking with you. God bless. We are your church. We Pray, revive this earth.